we've gotten practiced at just assuming that because we're America, people will be there. But that's getting to be a more contested proposition with China's rise and with there being another model um, of governance, I think a poor model, but nonetheless one that, that others are looking to see who's going to invest more in their infrastructure. Or, and so we got to work harder. And, um, but more than that, you, you, you know, if you show your respect, if you show that every individual has dignity and that that's not just a slogan or part of some human rights rhetoric, but it's something you're prepared to live, uh, those countries, or at least those individuals representing those countries, are there for you. And, and sometimes that meant that they would lobby their capital to try to vote in favor of something that they'd been instructed to vote against that I wanted them to. Why is investing in diplomacy so vital, especially at this point? We have almost more people who serve in military marching bands than we do diplomats out in the world. And, and yet, at a time when we have more conflict today than we've had in more than three decades. And what does conflict produce? Conflict produces refugees or migrants. Um, conflict produces a real drain on the global economy um, or on a particular uh, economy that we may wish to invest in or have our products uh, sold in. Um, conflict means pain and suffering. I mean, and, it, and it, when you see it happening as often as it's happening around the world, it also kind of numbs us, I think, just because there's so much exposure to conflict. So there's a kind of degradation that occurs. And yet, with an investment through diplomacy, as we did with the Ebola coalition, to, to use diplomacy to build that coalition, to be able to take away Iran's nuclear weapons program peacefully through diplomatic means, who wouldn't want that? Instead, we've, we, the United States, have pulled back from diplomacy. Europe is looking inward. China's not interested or not yet really all that good at it, frankly, when they do invest. And so what you have, again, is a perpetuation of these trends that are making everyone less safe. You've been critical of, of the Trump administration's approach to foreign policy. What qualities are you looking for in the next president, whether that be in 2020 or 2024, in order to, I guess, reset mm -hmm. uh, relations with our allies? And, and how would you advise them to reset those relations? Well, I think there is a bit of a loss of faith that has gone on on the left and the right in America's power to do good in the world. So I would start by looking to make sure that they have that confidence, that knowledge of all of the examples in which the United States has made a profound positive difference. Um, and I've given some of those examples. Again, a, a, a case that almost nobody talks about is ending the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Start with that. And then you mentioned specifically our allies um, a recognition of how important it is for the sake of U.S. security to have a community of democracies banding together. Right now at the United Nations, my old stomping ground, the U.S. is, a, is isolated because we're not formally with countries like China or North Korea or Russia because our values uh, are, are very different in terms of our internal system, our democracy, but we're also no longer with Europe on issues like women's rights, refugees, etc. And that means we're all weaker. And so to start the long rebuilding process of restoring US leadership in the world, making us more of a force for good, I think foundationally starts with injecting values into our foreign policy, remembering how central human rights are to why we have appeal around the world, but then finding countries with those shared values to join us and trying to restore the trust that has been lost.